eso cochoco te manica tototón What's up, Mena Nerds? Today we'll be pulling from every resource available from Legends and Canon to fully understand the Ewok people. Ingenious, artistic, mystical, and deadly with an insatiable appetite for meat, these are truly one of the most unique species in Star Wars. The story begins at Grid Coordinates H16 in the Outer Rim, on the forest moon of Endor. This moon had 18 hour days, 402 days in a year, and was relatively small at 4,900 kilometers in diameter, less than half the size of Earth, and had only 8% surface water. It's home to 30 million Ewoks, but also an unknown number of several other sentient species. It's rare to have so many intelligent beings develop on a single location, yet Endor is home to the Duloc, Ewok, Gorf, Tuzum, and Wisty. Deep dives into each can be their own videos, but we do need to understand them a bit to fully appreciate the world of the Ewoks. Duloks are distant relatives to our small friends, and were tribal warriors, highly aggressive and living mostly in the swamps. Essentially taller, stronger, dumber, and worshippers of the Night Spirit, an evil deity also recognized in the Ewok pantheon, and said to have come to Endor via a meteorite, with its dragon-like servant Mantagruz carrying out all its devilish wishes. They were one of the greatest threats to Ewoks, but rarely traveled up to the treetop villages. The Gorf or intelligent frog-like people were relatively harmless and kept to themselves. The Yuzum were not genetic relatives, but did share a lot of their love of music. At some point, these two species must have been in heavy contact with each other, as their languages are so similar that these two can communicate just fine. Over time, they must have diverged, possibly in some great war lost to history, as they do eat walklings, baby Ewoks, and some worship a being called Morag, an alien witch that saw the joy of the Ewoks as an impediment to her dark side powered magic. But by far, the most magical were the Wisties, also called fire sprites or fire folk. They were enigmatic fairy-like beings, guardians of the forests and by extension came to have good relations with the Ewoks. Their biology is one of the strangest on any world, beating even the telepathic shard species, as they had appeared to be completely plasma and able to set objects and enemies on fire. Understanding all that, let's look closer at their world. These little sentient humanoids stand at around 1 meter tall, making them about equal to a Jawa and less than half the height of a Wookiee. Some folks even playfully dub them mini Wookiees due to their size. They carry a solid weight of about 50 kilograms, or about 110 pounds, which is surprisingly dense for their compact frame. Little feisty, pint-sized wrestlers brimming with strength. As they grow, Ewoks follow a slightly accelerated maturation timeline compared to humans. Childhood ends at 9, adulthood kicks in at 14, they hit middle-aged at 30, and by 45 they're considered old. Venerable Ewoks keep on rocking well into their 60s. Ewoks are covered in fur from head to toe, showcasing various shades of brown and black. And while most flaunt solid colored fur, a few stand out with stylish stripes. There are even those rare ones with a nearly white or reddish fur, with pure red being the ultimate rarity in the Ewok world. And surprisingly, there is no record of this, but you'd imagine some people would love to get their hands on these hides. I can imagine an underworld manager strutting around in a full Ewok suit. It's just something y'all ain't know I knew. They used to run fast. <laughs> now their eyes were big and bright, their noses small and human-like, accompanied by an exceptional sense of smell. Those two-fingered hands topped with a nifty opposable thumb may seem diminutive, but don't let that fool you, Ewoks pack a punch, as they're actually strong enough to outmuscle trained human fighters. These furry friends are omnivores at heart, yet their main calorie source leans heavily on meat. Enjoying the forest buffet with no reservations, munching on just about any critter that crosses their path, even humans. Letting the Ewoks cook the enemy? Who am I to interfere? We must treat the enemy fairly. <laughs> they cleverly use their armor like a culinary cocoon, boiling up meats inside their plastoid shell until it's all fall off the bone tender. And who could forget the classic joy of a good old grilling session? <laughs> The forest floor beckons them to hunt, armed with stone-tipped arrows and spears. Their prowess was legendary, and they prided themselves as skilled hunters. A single Ewok could skillfully ensnare smaller creatures, yet when a hunting party assembled, their deadliness reached new heights. Boar wolves, towering in size, met their match in Ewok tactics. Devising a cunning plan, the Ewoks lured these mighty beasts with scraps of bloodied meat from previous endeavors. Then, a net of vines was poised on the forest floor. As the beast lunged for the bait, it became entangled, and from the shadows emerged Ewok warriors, charging with spears and poison darts. A single boar wolf yielded meat to sustain a village for days, a testament to their resourceful approach. 
For smaller game, Ewoks wielded sling nets with precision. A clever loop would trigger a pressure trap, launching the creature into a tree with a pinned sapling's release. In their defense against colossal Gorax, Ewoks reveled in their ingenious creations. The Tech Sui, aptly named Head Hitter and Basic, became their bulwark. When a Gorax menaced their village, Ewok warriors unleashed a mammoth log, suspended and swinging like a battering ram. It met the Gorax's advance with a resolute force. And as you might have been thinking, all these traps ended up being used against the Empire, proving triumphant and in a way you could see it all as a massive hunt, ending the same way with a massive feast. But the Ewoks world wasn't solely built on meat, mat berries emerged as another vital sustenance, these were squeezed for their juice, and it transformed into a brew with bitter notes. And while Ewoks were fine with eating other beings, they're not immune to being on the menu themselves. Other alien palates enjoy their unique flavor too. During the Clone Wars, the diner Power Sliders and Abafar even dished out Ewok jerky for those daring enough to try it. Looking into their tribes, we see that a council of elders reigns over each village, with the chief at the helm. Within each village, you'll find a mystic medicine man, guarding ancient secrets and tending to the wounded with skilled hands. While the warriors from various tribes decked out in tattered headpieces, each a badge of their unique group, their attire tells a story. Wooden chest shields, jaw bones of pint-sized creatures, and fierce teeth all proudly displayed. But that's not all, for these warriors are artisans of adornment. Feathers, necklaces, and pendants all come together in a symphony of trinkets, transforming their bodies into walking treasure troves. Now keep an eye out for the notable figures among the Ewok tribes, carrying totems that speak volumes about their status. The head warrior stands tall in a feathered crown known as the White Wings of Hope, a symbol of strength and inspiration. Meanwhile, the firstborn of the tribal leader's lineage dons the Red Wings of Courage, showcasing their noble spirit. As for the second son, the blue wings of strength grace their head, a testament to their fortitude. Turning to look at the intricate world of Ewok romance, where single males tread the path of solitude within the lush forest. Crafting their own cozy huts near the bustling tree city, they offer a helping hand when needed. But what adds a touch of magic to this tale are the unmarried females, secret admirers who grace the doorstep of solitary males with offerings, be it food, attire, and even weaponry. These heartfelt tokens speak of their affection, yearning for the return of these lost souls to embrace the warmth of companionship and family life. When the Ewok decides to take a mate, he embarks on a journey of love and commitment. A special family hut, nestled within the tree city, becomes their shared haven. As the hut takes shape, it serves as a beacon for his intentions, that he's ready to join in partnership, which is a behavior seen in some bird species. And here's where the tale takes a charming turn. All the unmarried females in the village strive to capture his heart, judging the man on his personality, but also his craftsmanship. Until the very last moment, as his dwelling reaches completion, the male keeps his heart open, undecided on his chosen companion. And when the moment arrives, the chosen female holds a unique power, the freedom to accept or decline both the male and this home that he's crafted with care. It's a dance of emotion, a celebration of choice, and a testament to the importance of mutual consent in Ewok unions, and also how much emphasis these people put on woodcraft. We don't know how many months this would take, but the next occupant of this hut would be the adorable Walklings. These fuzz-covered youngsters held a special place in Ewok hearts, their arrival turning the entire village into a chorus of adoration. From the moment they came into the world, attention flowed toward them like a gentle stream. Such was the depth of their care that looking after these little bundles was a shared duty, woven into the very fabric of their community. Walklings, though small, were mighty in their significance. While they might not have wielded many rights or the ability to feed themselves, they carried the weight of traditions and stories, soaking in the wisdom of rituals and legends that would be their guiding stars through life's journey. A tapestry of tales awaited them, offering moral compasses for the twists and turns promised by the life ahead. But the most thrilling moment awaited them as they reached the cusp of adulthood. The Festival of Hoods, a celebration like no other, marked this transition from Walkling to full-fledged Ewok. An enchanted festival where the air is filled with anticipation, where the rustling of leaves seem to carry whispers of destiny. With every heartbeat, the Walklings embrace their metamorphosis, ready to don their hoods and step into the next chapter of their lives. And in this unique society, each stage of life was a chapter. A journey marked by unity, tradition, but also the embrace of change. From cuddles with walklings to the festivals of hoods, and then the violence of the hunt, their culture allowed them to grow as strong and interconnected as the forest itself. I pause to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service, and it's 100% online. 
With BetterHelp, you can tap into their network of over 25,000 licensed and experienced therapists that can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences when it comes to therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's through chat, text, or a video or phone call. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule therapy sessions when it's convenient for you. If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch therapists for no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you'd expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who's custom-picked for you, there's more scheduling flexibility and at a more affordable price. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash metanerds. That's betterhelp.com slash metanerds. I've also linked them down in the description. Their compounds and the branches in many ways are similar to Wookiees, but with some notable differences. Nestled between the closely spaced trees, these villages were like jewels hidden in the foliage. In the heart of these tree havens was the central village, a cluster of thatched roof huts perched on the main limbs. These elevated abodes stood tall, out of the reach of lurking predators. Bridges dangled like threads of connection, weaving distant huts together, while knotted rope ladders offered pathways both up and down. In the realm of tree cities, tradition reigned supreme. The Elder's wisdom manifested in the grandest huts, embracing the very trunks of towering trees. The chief, a central figure, presided over these dwellings, with wide open spaces within these huts hosting a myriad of village activities, from gatherings, meetings, council fires, and mesmerizing storytelling rituals. Dotted throughout the village, family groups carved out their own havens on the outlying trees. Unmarried females, elders, and guests each found their designated sanctuaries within separate huts. Then a sealed structure, reaching higher than the rest, stood as the guardian of the community's sustenance, protecting their precious food stores. Yet there were those Ewoks that chose the nomadic path, giving up the comfort of the village for a life of wandering. Traditionalists playfully dubbed them Jindas, a nod to the nomadic Jindas tribe from Endor. Among these vibrant narratives, one village stood out, Bright Tree Village, the dwelling of Chief Chirpa's tribe. A masterpiece of Ewok architecture that offered a glimpse into the timeless rhythm of their forest life. Among the Bright Tree Village tribe, a few Ewoks once sought solitude in the scattered huts on the forest floor. The menace of the Sanyasin marauders nudged them back into the embrace of the trees, realizing the safety of elevated homes was their shield against attacks. Though water could do the trick too, Ewoks were versatile architects, also crafting abodes on tranquil lake shores. These villages were perched gracefully on stilts above the water's surface, with the water proving a natural barrier, safeguarding these lake dwellers from larger predators. Here, wicker traps automated the fishing process, luring in the catch of the day. And while the elders toiled, harvesting marsh grasses and drying them under the sun's warm gaze, the youth reveled in the water's embrace, unearthing buried treasures of shellfish. Ewok ingenuity didn't stop there, it extended to the rock faces beside cascading waterfalls. Here, tribes found their niche, elaborate water wheels turned like symphonies, driven by the waterfall's force. These spinning giants set in motion wooden gears that powered grindstones, directed conveyor belts across the village, and gracefully transported wooden elevator platforms that were constantly ascending and descending the cliff's heights. From treetops to lake shores and cascading falls, every dwelling was a testament to their resourcefulness, connecting their lives with the rhythms of nature. Now that we know how they lived, if you wanted to visit, we should try to learn the language. Ewokese was the language that danced on their tongues. C-3PO once dubbed it a primitive tongue, but even in its seclusion, he found himself drawn to its melody. The enigma lay in his ability to grasp its essence, a bridge between man and Ewok. And beyond the forest sanctuary, Ewoks were quick learners of other languages, including Universal Basic. Ewokese wasn't just a solitary note, it harmonized the languages of Endor's forest moon. Scholars speculated on its roots, proposing a link with the Yuzum language, another piece of evidence that pointed to the deeper ties between the Ewoks and Yuzum. With ease, Ewoks conversed in Yuzum, which was the doorway C-3PO used to engage with the Bright Tree Village's inhabitants. Their interaction with Duloks flowed seamlessly too, possibly implying a kinship between Ewokis and the Dulok language. Perhaps it was a dialect, or they all may come from some unknown source. Ewokis bloomed with more than 30 words to describe the towering conifers that housed their world, with the most prevalent being something that translated to life trees. When the Rebel Alliance strike team landed on Endor, C-3PO identified Yuzum as their way to converse, and their furry allies quickly picked up on this, even if the Golden God was surely speaking a weird dialect, allowing the Ewok named Wicket to guide the Rebels to the heart of the Imperial Bunker. Ewokese had a funny term for humanoid aliens when translated to galactic basic standard, the word was nakeds. 
and beyond the forest, on the sands of Jakku, a young scavenger named Ray acquired Iwaki's knowledge from the salvage ship's computers. And there was an Ewok basic pidgin language, where those in constant contact with each other did pick up some simple words from each other's language. Though looking through the list of these phrases and words, I'll put a bunch of these in the comments. One of my favorite is Fraza Kunatska, which is I understand basic. But why you wouldn't just say that in basic, unless they just mean to say that they can understand it but not speak it which may point to it being physically difficult to produce basic words, based on the anatomy of their vocal cords, like we saw with the Wookiees. There's also the very efficient Chiba Chiba Sopa, meaning hide and then come out chopping heads, and Pika Pika, though it's unclear if this refers to some sort of electric mouse. They're also known for their love of music, where celebrations, festivals, and rituals blossomed into joyful symphonies. There was a lifeblood in these canopies, enhancing their spirits and even their work. Their resourceful nature led them to embrace everything at their fingertips, to even helmets once worn by Imperial Stormtroopers and Naval Troopers being turned into drums, each producing a unique, lovely note. Their music wasn't just a pastime, it was the language that united their hearts. So when they sang during festivities or worked in tandem with rhythm, it really is just an audio version of everything else we see from their culture to architecture. Same goes for Tribal Games, a magnificent spectacle that united Ewoks from distant corners. Amidst the revelry, dance, and tales, the arena embraced daring deeds as well. Merriment mixed with danger. Enter the game of tree jumping, a favored pursuit of Ewok youth. Scaling the towering life trees, they perched upon the highest boughs, poised for a leap of faith. The challenge, to catch themselves on the way down, gripping onto lower branches until they gracefully descended to the forest floor. Every heart-stopping jump bore the risk of injury for those who missed their mark, or of course death, which is just another sign of the courage of the Ewoks. But as the sun set, the scent of smoky, combustible substances swirled from pipes, marking a ritual shared for both recreation and spiritual journeys. In the tendrils of smoke, a communion between Ewoks and something beyond took shape, a sacred dance that added yet another layer to their intricate world. With other festivities spread over the calendar year, it produced days that were not just gatherings, but grand galas that united tribes and families under nature's canopy. And then there was Halloween, a bewitching favorite among Ewoks. As the year donned its darker cloak, Ewoks embraced the tradition by dressing as playful phantoms. The forest adorned them in the magic of costumes, casting spells of laughter and camaraderie. For them, this was the pinnacle of celebration, where truly the entire community, even those Ewoks who passed on, could all still be intertwined. Even in the shadows, the spirits soared, as Halloween's ghosts roamed. Ewoks partied with a joy that mirrored the magic of this existence and belief that it continued on in the next plane. Many of their religious beliefs, like the village, were built around the Great Tree, that sacred sentinel in the woods. Ewok spirituality blossomed from nature's core, a pantheon of worship that celebrated gods of weather, trees, the hunt, engineering feats, and the cycle of fertility. Their days unfurled in a harmony of festivals and rituals, rain, sun, flowers, and fruits inspired magnificent gatherings. Yet there was another facet, the enigmatic dark rituals, which would involve at least bloody animal sacrifice. It's unclear if this included some Ewoks, and with such an emphasis on family and shared love, I hope the rituals weren't that dark, but they were always nocturnal affairs, beneath the sway of blazing bonfires. With a flick of their hands, the shamans released the leaves of hallucinogenic herbs into the flame, guiding the Ewoks into the realms of vivid dreams. These were moments of revelation, where the line between reality and spirit wavered. In every village, a mystic or shaman was appointed as a guide between worlds. Some were truth-tellers, while others wove tales like spider silk. But all were bound to the mystical, channeling abilities akin to Force sensitives. In exchange for their wisdom, the village bestowed crystals, shells, polished skulls, and other treasures that captured the shaman's fancy. Many shamans crowned themselves with animal skulls, a visual testament to their connection to the forest spirits. Shamans weren't just oracles, they doubled as healers, harnessing herbal medicines with a distinct aroma. A medley of fungus, lichens, roots, berries, and more composed their arsenal, each yielding varied medicinal effects. The towering coniferous trees, known as soul trees or life trees, stood as more than just foliage. These were live wire connections to the divine. It's said that with each walkling's birth, a seedling took root, embodying this sacred link. In times of turmoil, the shamans reached out to ancient spirits sheltered within the oldest trees, seeking counsel and solace. These interactions, cloaked in mystery, were perceived in private, but Ewoks never questioned the wisdom brought back by the shamans. For these voices, though never before heard, resonated with truth that spanned generations. The forest held secrets, and within its heart, Ewoks walked the path of faith, 
seeking guidance in the whispers of the leaves and rustling of the shadows. The last thing I want to mention before their history is their weaponry. In the arsenal of the Ewoks lay a diverse array of weapons, tools of defense and tactics rooted in their forest home. Knives, stone spears, slingshots, and bows. Amid the Battle of Endor, these weapons came to life, wielded with precision born from necessity. What we see during the Battle of Endor was all developed after thousands of years of hunting big game. Large rocks were hurled at stormtroopers, a reign of defiance that sought to unbalance their mechanized foes. Ropes served as snares, pulling scout troopers from their 74C speeder bikes, and inadvertently sealing their fate with neck-breaking impacts. Logs, symbols of the forest might, were employed to topple ATSTs, all coming together in a thunderous dance of destruction. But their arrows, seemingly simple, hoarded a potent secret. Tipped with a neurotoxin, these projectiles promised an agonizing end for their victims. A seemingly minor wound would become a harbinger of doom, as paralysis spread through every fiber, leaving the victim gasping for air. Even the task of breathing became a torturous struggle. Their ingenuity extended to the very terrain they knew so well. Pit traps, cunningly concealed, awaited foes lured by Ewok retreats. As the unsuspecting ventured in, stakes rose from the earth, impaling those who dared to pursue. In the throes of combat, their tactics remained intimate and fierce. Subduing enemies, they would wrest helmets away and unleash a barrage of bludgeoning with stone axes and knives forged from volcanic glass. Every strike carried the message of resistance. As the battle raged, Ewoks proved adaptable. When stormtroopers fell, their blasters were confiscated to be wielded against the very imps who brought them. Even the towering walkers, symbols of imperial might, were not beyond the Ewoks' grasp. Steadfast in their determination, they harnessed the knowledge of these mechanical beasts, taking control of Tempest Scout 2 and piloting it with the guidance of Chewbacca. The origins of hang gliders for the Ewoks were humble, serving as means of traversing their forest realm. But over time, these gliders transformed into tools of multifaceted utility. From their heights, Ewoks wielded rocks, spears, and slings, a novel approach to hunting from above. As they honed these techniques, they unlocked new dimensions, realizing their gliders could also be wielded against greater threats, including the towering Gorax. And their fairy friends helped them master this new tech as well. A symbiotic dance emerged, with the Wisties guiding the Ewoks through the perilous currents. And together they accomplished the extraordinary, wielding their gliders to quell a rampant forest fire, airdropping Master Longray's magic foam with precise accuracy. With the Rebellion's call for aid, their forest-born prowess elevated their fight, giving them the upper hand in this battle of galactic importance. However, the gliders faced a hurdle against the mechanized might of ATSTs. But nonetheless, they were essential for the movement of Ewoks in this battle. And those Wisties didn't just help in navigation either, but some would allow themselves to be stored in pouches so that the Ewoks could use them as a sort of magical Molotov, chucking the fire sprites at a foe and letting the fairies set them ablaze. And now turning to their history, though dwelling in a realm marked by primitive technology and isolation, Ewoks weren't entirely unknown to the galaxy at large, even before the Galactic Empire set foot on Endor soil. Evidence of their existence spanned eras, hinting at their far-reaching impact. In the midst of the Galactic War, an Ewok mercenary named Treek embarked on a journey that intertwined their destiny with the wider galactic conflict. While the phrase, a Rodian in Ewok's clothing, was an idiom that found its place in a speech by Mon Mothma on Agamar, preceding the Battle of Yavin. Yet it was Bright Tree Village that stood as a gateway between the forest and stars. Chief Chirpa and the medicine man Logre, leaders of this tribe, extended their hand to offworlders. They aided shipwrecked humans Mace and Sindel Tawani, guiding them through peril to rescue their parents from Agorax's clutches. Years later, as the vines of destiny wove tighter, the Ewoks found themselves entangled with the legacy of the Sanyasin Marauders. A valiant young Ewok, Wicket Risty Rorik, rose to the occasion, uniting with humans to thwart the Marauders and reclaim their kin. They painted their mark on the stars, a reminder that even in the deepest forests, the echoes of their presence resonated far beyond the trees. Even to remote Tatooine, in this arid land, Rowan Novaches, a native, wove tales that transcended worlds, a series of comics known as Ewok Pilot, a creative and humorous tale about how one of these tree people was so good at piloting starships. Yet despite all this, the halls of the Galactic Senate remained Ewokless. Even as they were recognized as sentient beings, their voices found no resonance within those hallowed chambers. Around 195 BBY, they remained absent from the Senate, a poignant reminder of the intricacies of galactic recognition. Perhaps budget cuts meant there were no credits for booster seats. 
The Republic is just lucky they didn't join the CIS. Unleashing swarms of droids and Ewok strike teams might have been too much to bear. Get it? As the cloak of the Galactic Empire descended upon the moon of Endor, they perceived the Ewoks as a quaint and harmless species. Yet an ill-fated attempt at initial contact led to a cascade of events. Imperial soldiers' misstep birthed fear among the Ewoks, and what followed was a rebellion of a different kind. Their assault on Imperial strongholds were met with swift retaliation, leading to the capture of numerous Ewoks as slaves, while their captors established operations in the proximity of Bright Tree Village. Amid this turmoil, the forest gods entwined the fates of Princess Leia Organa and Wicket W. Warwick, an Ewok who would guide her to his village as an honored guest. Another group would stumble upon Luke Skywalker, Chewbacca, Han Solo, R2-D2, and C-3PO. And in the gleam of the droid man, the Ewoks saw a long prophesized deity, the Golden One. A delicate dance of misunderstanding and revelation ensued, as fate pivoted on Skywalker's connection to the Force and the Protocol droid's translation skills. In a nocturnal gathering, C-3PO narrated the Rebel saga to the Council of Elders. Thus, the Ewoks opened their arms and hearts to the Rebel cause forging an alliance that resonated through the ensuing conflict. Their primitive weaponry took on an unforeseen potency, felling stormtroopers and imperial walkers. The sacrifices they bore painted the path toward the destruction of the second Death Star and the triumph of the rebels at the Battle of Endor. That night, the forest echoed with the jubilation of their victory and unity, fitting that the benevolent people, ignored by the Republic Senate and the greatest festival hosts, ushered the entire galaxy into the greatest shared celebration in recorded history. However, post-battle tales bore contrasting narratives. Imperial propaganda whispered of extinction, a claim quickly countered by rebel forces. In the aftermath, surviving stormtrooper Hoom Tarl bore a lingering grudge, his comrades' brutal fates fueling his animosity toward the Ewoks. The shifting tides of galactic power saw the Alliance of Free Planets briefly inhabit Bright Tree Village, although the Ewoks navigated this turbulence, resolving conflicts and confronting outside threats. As time grew on, the Ewoks ventured beyond Endor, some becoming daring pioneers. Trading posts anchored by the New Republic bridged the gap between their forest haven and the galaxy's embrace. Ewoks again donned the mantle of warriors, fighting alongside the New Republic in decisive battles against the Imperial Remnant, all seen as forces of that evil night spirit. I can't help but laugh at what must have been an insanity-inducing experience. Some imp who managed to survive the Battle of Endor, get off-world and rejoin his allies, taking the fight to the NR on some far-off desert world, maybe a dense city or some space station, only to watch his friend get nub-nubbed by a Bear Team 6 ambush. Amidst these expansions, an Ewok colony flourished on Svivrin, which presented new challenges as it was mostly mountainous and flat farmland. No lush forests, but endless supplies of friends and experiences to be made in the large cities. On their home soil, the New Republic's semi-permanent outposts acted as conduits, leaving sporadic connections between Ewoks and the wider galaxy. Endor's embrace saw yet more chapters unfold, as Luke Skywalker's Jedi forces sought refuge among the trees during Darth Cadus's reign. Their presence bringing that old specter of Imperial landing pads, these cold metal blights on the forest. Endor's tale extended beyond the battlegrounds, as the New Republic left their mark through the semi-permanent outposts like Sulphur's trading posts and scattered near Ewok villages. In that epoch of Darth Cadus, Luke Skywalker and his Jedi cohort sought refuge within the Ewok's leafy haven, crafting a temporary bastion within their home. The moon's embrace harbored the Jedi, sheltering them before their journey took them beyond the realm of the transitory mists. While the vestiges of the past remain tangible, old Imperial landing pads, their echoes unswayed by time's passage, stood ready to serve the Jedi as they navigated their way through Endor's verdant terrain. When the First Order emerged to take over the galaxy, one of the first to pledge their paws to the Resistance were the Ewoks, and all of Endor worked with their old friend Leia to again fight for freedom. Warwick and his son Pommet witnessed firsthand the Haldo maneuver. So that's it for their breakdown. There are two details from New Canon that are so odd I wanted to put them here. First, there was a practice of using therapy Ewoks, like therapy dogs, to help war vets with their PTSD. The Ewoks agreed to this out of sort of a thank you for destroying the Empire, but the galaxy owed the Ewoks a huge thank you. The idea that these intelligent species were assigned like dogs is crazy. And then there is the Ewok Civil War. There are no details on this, just a passing scene in this comic. And it just doesn't make sense that they were so peaceful for so long, to have a civil war shortly before the Battle of Endor. To the comic's defense, I don't even know if this was intended to be full canon, even though nothing says it's explicitly not canonical. The name Ewok is just Wookiee mixed up, and it's meant to be a nod to the Miwok Native American people. 
the Ewoks revered their stories, but also would often not take them literally. Wicket, for example, said that the legendary creature Krolok was simply a wisty tale invented to scare walklings. Originally, the Empire was to be defeated by the Wookiees, but since Lucas wanted the high-tech bad guys to be defeated by simple, nature-loving primitives, he felt Wookiees shouldn't be used since he already established that Chewbacca was great with tech. I don't doubt that cute toys and other merch influenced this decision as well. And part of this want for the primitive victors comes from his love of Joseph Campbell's work, showing the timeless themes and myths, with the simple, good-natured underdog overthrowing the evil, artificial beings. Same thing with the hobbits being able to defeat Sauron, and his complex war machine. But Lucas then went out of his way to explain that it was also inspired by the Viet Cong. There is some confusion over whether or not the Ewoks can use the Force, and they have traditions that commune with it, but the only Jedi example is from Geonosis and the Outer Rim Worlds. While other writers claim that they were like the Volturine species and unable to become Jedi. Also, all those Ewoks shown from Caravan of Courage, Battle of Endor, and the Ewok show, consisting of 35 psychedelic episodes, were all considered full canon up until the Disney buyout. And like the Wookiee, they were of the original 24 character templates in the first role-playing game guide. Ewok Hunt is one of the best things to come from the newer Battlefront 2, and the Rebel Infiltrator class can be played as an Ewok. Many in-universe speculated that debris falling from the destruction of the second Death Star would have killed everything on world, but this rumor was fought by other characters, and of course we see that that wasn't true. One of the strangest events in all of Star Wars filming history was when the Ewok actors went on strike. Margot Apostolos, who played Top Cat, laughed as he recounted the moment when their bus pulled up, but nobody got out confusing the rest of the crew, only for hordes of the Ewok actors to come running down the hill screaming revenge, while wearing shirts saying revenge of the Ewoks in a form of protest over conditions on the set. If you want to learn more, be sure to check out the Essential Guide to Species, Complete Locations, and these RPG source books. Check out these videos, I'm sure you'll like them, but most important of all, remember, for that fall off the bone texture, you want to get that flame burning low and slow, and keep the stormy shell on, and the force will be with you, always.